Hey friends, it's Jessica from Three Rivers Homestead, and look at that, our first crocus of the season. That means spring is almost here in northwestern Ohio, and because the weather is beginning to change, all the snow has melted, and the sun is out, we actually had some days this week that were in the 70s, which is unseasonably warm for us here, but that just means the nature of the work here on our homestead is changing a lot, and so in this video, We'll be doing a lot of garden work because that is what we've been up to this week. And so we're going to share with you an update on what's going on in the garden. We'll also share a little bit of kitchen work toward the end of the video and then some fun uh, homeschool activities that we did this week. And if that's something that interests you, why don't you stick around? As you can see, we're taking advantage of these sunny days to hang our laundry outside. And I just enjoy there's nothing like line dried laundry. And then remember last week I showed you these winter sown jugs. These are our cold hardy seeds that we began in milk jugs and you can learn all about that in uh, my winter sowing videos. But since it didn't rain and it was so sunny this week, we're making sure that we're watering inside the jugs with a spray bottle oh, every other day or so just to make sure that those seeds are wet and can germinate. And actually we noticed that some of the mustard greens actually germinated. You see a little bit of green in there, so that is so exciting. Now inside the house on our grow light stands, our peppers are definitely in need of being up potted. They are growing out of their little seed starting trays and they need to be transferred into these solo cups. That will give the roots a chance to have a little more room to grow and so we're just going to transfer these today. Now we up pot into solo cups, like I mentioned, and these are something that we reuse every year. Most of these are solo cups that we actually saved from the trash at family gatherings. We just rinse them out, save them for this purpose. We do cut a hole in the bottom of the cups for drainage, and then we just fill with our potting soil and transfer our little seedlings into the cups. Now I always get the question, why don't we just start the seeds in the cups to begin with? Why go to the extra work to transfer them? And well, we do that mostly to save on energy. By starting in the seed trays, that allows me to keep these pepper plants under one row of lights for the first month or so that I was growing them. But as they start to need more room and I put them in these cups, they're going to take up a, a lot more space. And now I'm going to need two rows of lights for everything that I'm growing. So the only reason that I start them this way instead of just starting the seeds in the cups to begin with is just so we don't have to run those lights for that extra month. Now I always get questions about these seed starting trays. These are new to me this year. I got these from Tractor Supply. They're made by Burpee and they are a seed starting tray with a silicone bottom. So they make it really easy to pop the seedlings out and you just pop them out and then we can separate them if we started more than one seed per hole and then just put them into their own cup. But I highly recommend these seed starting trays. They're very durable and will last me, you know, forever if I take good care of them. And so they were definitely worth the investment. If you've been looking at these at Tractor Supply and wondering if they are as simple as they seem to get the seedlings out of the trays, they really are. And you'll see that my Little boys are able to do that themselves at just three and five years old. Letting the little boys help with jobs like this always means that maybe one or two plants aren't going to survive the process, but it's really important for their confidence that they're allowed to try these things. And when you let them try them when they're this little, by the time they're six, seven, eight, nine, they're so confident in their skills that they're capable of doing this all by themselves without your supervision. So look at that. He's so proud of himself for separating those seedlings. And we did lose two plants in the process, but that's why you just plant a little extra and that'll make up for it. And there you go. All of the pepper plants are now in their new little cups. Lots of comfy room to grow and grow some strong roots. We just need to get them watered and they will be good to go. Let me give you an update on everything else we have under the grow lights. So the chives that we started a couple weeks ago are growing. Also the bunching onions are sprouted in there and doing great. We're still waiting on our asparagus. 
asparagus can take up to 21 days to germinate and we're right about at that point so I'm hoping we see some green here on those trays here in the next few days. Other than that we just have our onion um, sprouts up here and they're doing great but they do need a little bit of a trim. If you trim your onions as they're growing that makes the plant put more effort into growing strong roots and then it expends less energy trying to grow the greens and also strengthens and thickens those greens so that they don't fall over. And so you can actually save those little clippings. They do taste like onion and they're great um, to just kind of chop up and put in things like eggs. Let me show you what we've been up to outside this week. As I said, the weather was beautiful and so that gave us a chance to get to work. The garden is a mess for me not really doing anything to put it to bed last fall. So we have had our work cut out for us. What I've decided to do this year is convert my garden into all raised beds. So I purchased these galvanized steel beds back in January from Amazon. I got an amazing deal on them then. I'll link them in the description, but they have gone up in price since I purchased them back then, as most gardening supplies do when they're in season. But what we're doing, we have about 18 of these beds to put together. And the reason I'm switching to raised beds this year is just because I battled with the voles so terribly last year. They were eating a lot of my plant starts, especially the beans. And by switching to raised beds, that will prevent that from being a problem. So if we put the landscape fabric down underneath, and then I'm going to take hardware cloth. I bought hardware cloth. They're in these boxes right here. Also from Amazon, I bought a fourth inch hardware cloth. And we'll line the inside of the garden beds with that and that will prevent the voles from being able to tunnel up into my beds and hopefully that will solve my problem and i'll show you this once i get those put into the beds here in the next couple weeks so yeah we definitely have our work cut out for us here converting our garden all to raised beds but i think we're going to like the results one area we don't have to convert this year is the garlic area. I planted this garlic in October pretty late and I was kind of worried about how it would do, but lo and behold, here it is in the spring and they are sprouting and doing wonderfully under their little mulch bed of straw. So this area, unfortunately, I can't convert to raised beds this year because we can't disturb this garlic, but eventually once we pull that, that will be converted also. So we laid down new landscape fabric in this area and I'll link the fabric that we used in the description. But all of these areas will be filled with more of the galvanized steel beds. And then back here in the corner, I have an old cinder block bed that I had built last year and it contains my mint and some other perennial herbs. And then in the holes around the bed, I plant flowers and annual herbs. This messy area along the side, I plant peppers in my buckets, and then these Dollar Tree towers are usually filled with flowers and other fun things. Then I just moved some cinder blocks to create a new bed here, and I believe this is where I'm going to put my onions this year, so that will be nice. Over here are our blackberries, and then these beds are all full of perennial herbs and strawberries kind of mixed together, so those will stay as they are this year. You can see this is the spot where I just pulled up those cinder block beds. I need to level it out and then we will lay down more landscape fabric over that and probably put two more of the steel beds right there in those spots. Directly behind that is that area of garlic that I had mentioned that we will just leave as is until we harvest it. And then over here we lay down more fabric and we have four beds right here. These will mostly contain my greens. I'll plant things like lettuce and kale and my other greens right here in the front of the garden because this gets shaded at certain times of the year. Then over here I have the strawberry plants that I propagated. I showed you how I do that in a video last year and I never had a chance to get them in the ground after propagating them. So I'm hoping that some of these strawberries survived the winter of just being in these containers and it looks like some of them might make it. So we will see and whatever makes it will get put back in the strawberry beds. And I'll keep you updated as this continues to develop into this year's garden. All right guys, I've been working out in my garden and while I'm still dirty, I'm gonna go ahead and plant some um, tomato seeds. Tomatoes are one of my favorite things to grow in the garden. So it's always really exciting to get those seeds started. 
We're here on kind of the border of zones five and six, and so mid-March is a good time for me to start those, um, those tomato seeds. If I start them any earlier than now, they're gonna end up so big that I'm gonna need to up pot them <laughs> multiple times, and I end up with like these trees <laughs> that need to get in the ground. I typically don't plant out until Mother's Day weekend here where I'm at in Ohio. A lot of times the almanac will say it's safer sooner than that, but I don't trust it because we'll have sometimes frosts in the beginning of May. And so I just prefer to wait just to be safe until about the second weekend of May. And so if I start them now, that gives me two months. I'll, I'll have a decent sized tomato plant to get in the ground um, by the time it's safe to get them out there. So let me show you what I'm planting this year. I'll show you the stuff I, I've planted before that I've had good results with, and I'm gonna show you some new things that I'm trying. So um, the thing that I will plant the most of is Amish paste. This is my trusted tomato for canning tomato sauce. It's a very meaty tomato, isn't super juicy, so you don't have to cook it down as much as you do other kind of juicier types of tomatoes. And so, this is what I will plant the most of in my garden just because I like it for canning purposes. So always have that one. Um, the rest of these I'll just do a couple um, at the most maybe four plants of each just because I like to have a variety of pretty tomatoes in my you know harvest baskets. Um, one of my favorite ones I always have great results with is a black crim. I've probably grown this now for four years and just really prolific. I have great results with this. Um, another one that I've always had great results with is Pink Jazz. I've done this maybe three years in a row now, and they're so pretty. I have a thing for stripy tomatoes, which you're going to see <laughs> in some of my other selections. But Pink Jazz I've had great results with, so I will be um, growing probably four plants of this again this year. Um, I do a Mortgage Lifter and a brandy wine. Both of these are really large um, tomatoes, they're good slicers for like sandwiches and things like that. So I'll just do a couple each of those. And then this is uh, Paul Robeson. It's another kind of darker colored, kind of like the black crim. I like the black crims better, but since I have these seeds, I'm just going to go ahead and plant some this year. I'll probably just do maybe two of these. And so those are things that I have done before, my main tomatoes. Um, as far as cherry tomatoes, these Peace Vine cherry tomatoes, I like these. They're really pretty. I did them last year, and I'll just do uh, maybe a couple plants. We don't need a lot of cherry tomatoes, despite our large family size. A lot of the children are not a fan of just eating raw tomatoes, but Adam, myself, and a couple of the older children do enjoy snacking on these, so I just do a couple. Now, in previous years, I've done yellow pear tomatoes. And I am not going to do them this year. I did them last year and every single one of them would split before I was able to harvest them. So I am just not even going to waste my garden space on them this year. And I'm going to try something else in its place. I ordered these from Baker Creek. Black strawberry. They're really pretty. And they're kind of another little snacking tomato. So I'm going to do that in place of my yellow pear. I was so disappointed because... Two years ago, I grew yellow pear tomatoes, and they were just, there were so many of them, and they were wonderful, and I don't know if it was the weather or what last year that caused them, um, you know, to split. Sometimes if you don't get a lot of water for a while, and then all of a sudden they get a good watering, you know, the tomatoes will split all of a sudden, but I was watering consistently pretty much every evening for a while there, and they were still splitting, so I'm not even going to waste my time. We'll just try these, and we'll see how that goes. I told you I do like stripy <laughs> tomatoes. There's just something about it. I find them fun and um, just pretty. So I'm going to try these solar flare tomatoes, and I'm also going to do these Berkeley tie-dye pinks, and we'll see how we like those. As I mentioned, I really like the pink jazz. These kind of remind me of them, but in different colors. So I imagine having a little um, harvest basket with all of these pretty different colored stripy tomatoes, and that makes me really happy. So we're going to try that. Um, I'm going to try this black from Tula. I love my black crim tomatoes, so I'm going to see, you know, if I, there are some other varieties that I like as much and are as prolific. So this is another one we're going to try that's new. And then I do like a good pink tomato, so I'm trying these German pink this year. And that is my tomato selection that I'm going to go ahead and get seeds started. 
and and then today while I'm at it and while I have the dirt and the trays out, I'm just going to start a couple herbs that need to be started a little earlier. Parsley is one that you want to start about eight to ten weeks before your last frost. And we're about eight weeks out right now. So I'm going to do a curled parsley and then I have a flat parsley. Um, this was one that is leftover seed from our garden last year. Uh, it had went to seed and so I saved some. We're going to do that. And then we are also going to try some rosemary. I have not had great results at trying to grow rosemary from seed in the past, but I will not give up. I keep trying. One of these years I'm going to figure out, you know, what the method for success is here in my zone. So we're going to go ahead and try it and see how it goes. So I'm going to get these plants uh, or these seeds planted. And then um, my grow light situation here in the house is going to be pretty much filled up. Anything else that I want to start from seed, I'm going to have to either do in jugs, kind of winter sown outdoors, or I'm going to have to figure out another solution. So, all right, I'm going to get so busy. So a lot of people ask why I do so many different varieties of tomatoes instead of just sticking to a couple varieties that I really love and doing more of those plants. And really it's just because I like to have pretty harvest baskets that have a variety of colors and shapes and sizes in them. It's just kind of fun. And tomatoes are one of my favorite things to grow, so why not do a lot of it? So I'll put two seeds per hole here. And so with the number of plants that I'm growing, I'm going to have well over 100 tomato plants once I separate them out, which you saw my garden space. I definitely don't have enough space for that many tomatoes. So what I'll do is I'll plant and I end up putting tomatoes anywhere I can find space, any bucket or container or wherever I can find space, I'll make room for tomatoes. And then what I have left over, I tend to just give away to people. So it's fun when someone stops by to just send them home with, you know, a couple tomato plants and maybe some herbs. And that brings me a lot of joy. So you can never have too many plants. Someone will find space for them if you start them. So when starting seeds, I use either regular potting soil or a seed starting mix. When I go to the store, I just grab whatever they have that's cheapest or on sale that I can find. I'm not really that picky about it. And I plant my seeds directly into that. And then just like with the peppers, I'm putting these in seed starting trays because it takes up less space on my grow lights when I do it this way. And then by the time these need light, um, I'll turn on my bottom rack of lights for them. I can leave them off in the meantime. And then when these need up potted into solo cups, they're going to take up more than one row of space on my grow lights. So at that point, I'm hoping that my onions will be ready to be moved outside. And then that will free up a whole lot of space here. So I've got all my seeds planted. They're all labeled. And I just need to thoroughly water these and get them over on the grow light stand. Have the one tray of herbs there. And that feels really good. Tomatoes are my favorite, so I'm happy to have those planted. And so as I mentioned, I just have two rows of lights right now on what I already have planted. And then those tomato seeds can just sit down here in the dark. As long as they stay wet and warm, they'll germinate down there. And then as soon as they start to germinate, I will turn the lights on and that will work just fine. And this is the one area of grow lights I have. Unfortunately, I don't have a greenhouse, so this is what we do to make do. I'm just showing you those onions that I trimmed. See how much healthier they look? They're a lot stronger when you trim them up, so there we go. Let's move on to some kitchen work now. We had a fun day this week in homeschool, and we decided to have a day of pies because Monday, three... 14, March 14th was pie day. I'm making some gluten-free crusts using my pie crust recipe here. So I made one batch of gluten-free crust and then I made three more batches of regular crust. We are just going to make a bunch of pies today for pie day. And I have shared my process. I use a food processor to make my pie crust and I've done that in a video before when we did our Thanksgiving baking. I'll link that in the description if you want to check it out. Pies are so easy to make, especially when you have home canned pie filling. I grabbed one peach pie filling and one pear pie filling. And now that I have my crusts all made up, this will make making a bunch of pies today super easy. So we're going to do a total of four pies today and I'll share that in a minute. But first, 
I need to get to school since it is Pi Day. The children, I decided to do a group lesson with all of them all about the number Pi. So I have my notes up on the board and then I just called all of the children down and we just sat down and had a quick talk about what the number Pi means. My older boys in their math already use Pi in some of the geometry that they have to do, so they are well aware. The younger girls, this was very new to them. And so we just talked about some practical applications. We talked about how when we tap um, maple trees, we've had to use pi to um, calculate what the circumference of the tree was in order to know, or not the circumference, to calculate what the diameter of the tree was. I'm sorry, to know how many times to tap it. And so this was just a really fun lesson that day for the kids. And then this was pretty cute. Um, I showed them how if you take the number 3.14 and you look at it in the mirror, it actually spells pi, P-I-E backwards. So they thought that that was pretty cool when they saw that. That was just a fun pie day activity that I had seen online that I thought that we would do. And the kids really got a, a kick out of that. So as a homeschool mom, this is just one of those really fun days that you can um, make about learning and fun. Here the ch children were taking all of the digits in pi and they were graphing them to make a skyline of a city that then they could color in and paint and decorate. So just a really fun day of school for us. Obviously the kids had other work to do, but this is just how we started our school day. And so while they're now working on their individual language arts and other math lessons, I'm working on getting my pies together. I'm starting by doing my gluten-free pie. I decided to make a pumpkin pie for that for myself. This was gluten-free and also sugar-free for me. And then David decided that for his uh, schoolwork today, as you guys know, David wants to be a baker when he grows up. So he chose a new pie that he's never made before for part of his schoolwork today. And he decided to make lemon meringue. So since I already had the pie crust ready, I'm just getting that in a dish for him. And then he is going to make a lemon meringue pot. I will share the recipe that he chose to use in the description. What David has to do, since we are a food allergy family and we can't have dairy or peanuts, whenever he finds a recipe that he wants to try, if there's any kind of butter in it or any kind of milk, he will take the recipe and he will make the appropriate substitutions. He's pretty good by this point at knowing what things will substitute well in certain types of recipes. And then he just sort of adapts it and makes his own recipe that really works um, pretty well. He's pretty good at it. And I think that that will benefit him as a professional baker one day, having all of this experiment experience with making substitutions and you know having to get creative in the kitchen with adapting recipes. He's learning that at a very young age. So since it was Pi Day, I decided to get out my little stamps. They're in the Amazon storefront in my bio, the, the stamps that I use for all of my pastry decorations. And I just thought, why not, since it's Pi Day, make the topping of the pie fun. I am definitely not a professional baker and don't really worry about um, making it look perfect. I just wanted it to be fun for the kids and they got a kick out of this. One of the questions I often get about our baking in our house is why are pies and things tend to look so pale? Why don't we brown our baked goods? And it's a really good question, but um, most of our recipes, since they are dairy-free, um, are lower in sugar. And when you do dairy-free baking and sometimes even gluten-free baking, things don't turn out the way they do with you know conventional baked goods that would have those ingredients in them and oftentimes they do turn out paler, and that's just fine. I know a lot of people say it looks unappetizing, but it works just fine for us, and that's how we like it. Um, you can see our pies right there, and I think sometimes the lighting, too, of the camera maybe makes these things look a little lighter than they, they look in person, but it works for us. But David's pie, his meringue, definitely browned beautifully. I'm very proud of him. He did a beautiful job for his first lemon meringue pie, and there's our gluten-free, sugar-free pumpkin pie, and then we have our peach pie and pear pie. And so just a fun day of pies for pie day. After all of that work in the kitchen, I needed to do dishes and clean up, but the baby also was ready for a nap. So as a busy mom, the best thing I could do is just put the baby on my back and rock him to sleep while I get the work that I need to get done. 
I've been baby wearing for 14 years now, and it's such a lifesaver as a busy mom. As you can see, he's perfectly content back there. He's close to me and pressed up against me and thinks he's being held. And so if I kind of rock back and forth as I'm doing my work, it lulls him to sleep just as if I was rocking and holding him on my front. You can see him rubbing his eyes, and then he was out just after 15 minutes of doing dishes. So if you are a busy mom and you're struggling in this way, baby wearing is such a time saver, such a help. I can't recommend it enough. We had all of the other pies with lunch as part of our pie day festivities, and then we saved um, David's beautiful lemon meringue pie there for dinner. This is what the kids had for dessert with dinner. And Adam, who is quite the pie connoisseur, told David that this was the very best lemon meringue pie he's ever had. So David did a remarkable job in his schoolwork that day. I'm very proud of him. And he used the frozen lemon juice that we um, had preserved in January. We just thawed some and that's what he used for the fresh lemon juice and it worked out wonderfully. So I think there will be more lemon meringue pies in our future for sure. Something we have a lot of right now is eggs. Our hens have definitely picked up on the new spring-like weather and they, we are getting an abundance, almost two dozen eggs a day sometimes, so we need to use eggs up. So I am making my walls of Jericho. I made that for you guys during the pantry challenge and we'll link the video in the description that explains that process. But other than using up eggs in walls of Jericho, now is the time for me to also begin water glassing eggs. I've done many videos on water glassing that you guys can also find in the description. The problem right now is that many of the eggs we're getting are not always clean. And when you water glass eggs, you need them to be perfectly clean. You do not want to wash them up or scrub off the bloom. You want to keep that bloom intact. And so I just take whatever clean eggs that are perfectly clean that I get for the day and those I'm just water glassing a few at a time in a jar. So the you use one quart of water per one ounce of calcium hydroxide or cow lime. I get food grade cow lime from Azure Standard in bulk and that's what I'm measuring out right here. I'm just going to dump that into my big gallon jar and as I collect, let's say I get two dozen eggs, you know, today, I'll grab out the five of them that are completely clean. They don't have any mud, any chicken mess or anything on them. And those ones I will put into the jar and I just keep adding them. It's okay to do that. You can just add them as you get them as long as they stay below the water line. And then once you fill a jar, you can tuck that away and start a new one. So this is what's working for us right now because in the spring, there's a lot of rain, there's a lot of mud in the chicken runs, and it's very hard for the chickens to lay perfectly clean eggs. So this is a great way to just kind of preserve what you get each day if you don't get a lot of clean ones at once. Our goal this year for water glassing, again, is 40 dozen eggs. And here is Adam, thinking he's funny. He wanted to pretend to be my hands. <laughs> So I'm like, stop it, I need to get back to work. <laughs> um, anyways, so my goal is once again to do at least a minimum of 40 dozen water glassed eggs. That will get us through the winter when our hens take a break. Now another way that I'm currently using up all the eggs that we get, I'm hard boiling them for snacks. Every time we finish a jar of pickles, this is a store-bought jar of pickles, but I also do this with homemade pickled vegetables or hot peppers and things. I will hard boil some eggs and I will just put them in that leftover juice, the pickle juice, and let that soak for a day or two and absorb the flavor of the pickles. And this is a favorite treat for my children here in our house. They love this as a snack. So it's a great way to use up excess eggs. Once we eat all the eggs, I will drain all the juice out and clean it out to use that glass jar for storage. And many of you have asked how I get the pickle flavor out of my gallon jars. And I do that by simply letting the jar sit with dish soap in it and water for about 24 hours. And then that removes most of the stink and then you can clean it and use it. The jar is what I typically find holds the pickle smell the worst. And that I need to soak in some vinegar to help remove the smell. And then sitting them outside, both the jar and the lid, letting them sit in the sunshine for a day also does wonders for removing the pickle smell. So 
If you want to reuse your jars, hopefully those tips can help you. One final project that I was doing on this day while I was busy in the kitchen and the kids were playing outside, I'm going to go ahead and start some lettuce seeds. This is Marvel of Four Seasons Lettuce. It's my favorite uh, lettuce. I got these seeds from Azure last week. And whenever I have an empty salad container or an empty jug, I go ahead and winter sow a few more seeds in them. And I just add it to my collection outside. And then this lettuce will be protected by um, the lettuce container here. And it will serve as a greenhouse so that if we do get nights that are below freezing or whatever, um, these lettuce sprouts will be protected. And that's about it for this week, you guys. It's been a wonderful week. We did have some adjusting to do with daylight savings time and the change that happened there. It definitely pushed our mornings back a little bit, but I'm enjoying that after dinner, the kids can play outside until the sun begins to set. It's just been lovely having that extra daylight in the evenings. We are really enjoying it here. And so I hope you guys enjoyed this peek into our week. In the coming weeks, I'll be sharing a lot more of how our garden is progressing, as well as more food, food projects that we're doing and homeschool work. But until then, have a great week, friends. Bye.